All right, ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, it's time for another student of the gun radio. Yes, indeed. Oh, my goodness. What day is today? So from uh, from now until the end of time, August 14th will be known as Geek Day or YC9 Day or whatever. <laughs> Oh, it finally happened. Yes, indeed. We're going to talk about it. Yes, we're not going to talk about it in great detail right now at the beginning of the show because it's the primary topic. So, because it's the primary topic, we will be talking about it at the end of the show. But, uh, oh, man, we've got a lot for you today. We've got a lot for you today. We're going to talk about J- Jared, I found, I discovered a crazy scope mount, a long-range scope mount. Uh, oh, you and- did? Yeah, you're not going to believe it. You're not going to believe it, and, and it fits right in with uh, with our recent discussions about long range rifle shooting and oh, ele- elevation and and so on and so forth. And uh, in our homeroom, uh, are the, is it up to the police to protect you and save you, or is it up to you? Uh, I think it's up to you. We'll find out. And uh, then, of course, we have the, we're going to talk about the Yeet Cannon, the YC9 in great detail. And today I'm coming to you. Oh, man. I, let, me, let me sip my coffee. My throat is a little <clears throat> today. So, All right. I'm sitting in the Frog Lube studio chair speaking to you in the black carbon steel microphone. That's yes, right. Indeed. It keeps you smelling minty fresh all day long. That's right. That's right. So, Zach, go ahead and play that funky music and we'll get into it. Welcome to Student of the Gun Radio, planting freedom seeds since 2013. Here, we don't just talk about guns and gear, we also discuss current events and politics, because guns are politics. Now, sit back, relax, and allow today's episode to drip ever so gently into your ear. Please welcome your co hosts, founder of Mastermind Media and Consulting Group, Jared Martin, and the shipping owner, Zach Martin. Now, give it up for your beloved host, the Pin Hand of America, Professor Paul Barkley. All right. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So, so, well, congratulations. Step number one, congratulations to our friend Nicholas Orr. Yes, indeed. The prolific author, Nicholas Orr, the, uh, the author of the... Uh, the Pipe Hitters series, uh, the series of Pipe Hitter Guides, the author of the fiction series The Operator, which you should be checking out if you haven't checked those out. If you're a fan of fiction or if you're just looking for something uh, to check out, something interesting to read, I think you'll enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, well, I don't know, get better taste. But uh, last week, Last week, actually, I think this dropped right when last week's show was coming out. Uh, it is a Pipe Hitter's Guide to Small Arms and Weapons. Pipe Hitter's Guide to Small Arms and Weapons. Uh, and it is the top new release on Amazon in the Survival and Emergency Preparedness category, uh, which is interesting. Uh, and then it is also the top new release in Sports Hunting. It's always interesting, and it is the number one best-selling book in hunting and fishing anthologies. <laughs> okay, then. Yeah, so uh, our boy That's Nicholas funny. Orr is is officially a best-selling author. We, of course, we all knew that. We all knew that before now that he was a best-selling author. But uh, but yes, it is now official. It has been he's been certified by Amazon as a best-selling author. So the Pipe Pitters Guides, one, two, three, four. They're not numbered one, two, three, four, but uh, you can get them all. And uh, very soon, we talked to Nick, and uh, we're going to have this new book uh, on the Shop SOTG store very soon, um, within a week. It'll be there within a week, along with all the other ones. So there you go. If you're not caught up, then you can go ahead and catch up. And uh, our apologies to uh, Doug Arnold's wife. who says that he needs to just stop buying so many books all the time. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So there you go. Congratulations to our friend Nick Orr. Best-selling author, top new release. The top new release. And uh, you can check, all, check out all of that stuff. And then there's books from this dude named Paul Markle, 
uh, they're out there too. I believe that we have all the books from Paul Markle on shopsotg.com, but this isn't a, a, a store commercial right now. This is this is student of the gun radio. There you go. Yes, indeed. All and, right. Oh, just, what, what were you going to do, Zach? I was just going to let you know that uh, right now on shopsotg.com, you can order the new Pi Pitter book, and it will go oh, out as go. soon as they enter the warehouse. As soon as they get to the warehouse. Yep. So cool. So right. if, if you Thank place you your order much, and it so. doesn't ship in like 20 minutes, then don't be surprised because, again, as soon as Take, they, as soon as they actually down. get to the warehouse, but we don't want to make you wait too long. <laughs> Secure yours immediately. No, That's if you're not going to ship it within 20 minutes of me ordering it, then I'm I'm not, I, don't, I don't want it. I don't want it. <laughs> if you're not going to get it, get in your car and drive it to my house, I, I don't want it. <laughs> Oh, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Man, we got a lot of stuff to talk about today. A lot of stuff to talk about today. Oh, uh, hey, quit moving crap around there. You I, I'm moving person. That because we need to get into some content, and I'm excited to talk about this crazy long range mount. Oh, okay. Mentioning. All right. I thought that was next. But all right. So uh, we're going to jump right into our Brownells bullet points of the day, brought to you by Brownells. All right, bing, bang, boom. So what have we been doing this last few weeks? Well, we've been doing long-range shooting. We did the uh, the HEPR, H-E-P-R, the High Elevation Precision Rifle. We did the HEPR uh, and the last weekend of July. And then uh, we did the A-H with the A-HEPR, the Advanced High Elevation Precision Rifle. And one of the things that uh, we get into when we're talking about long range, is elevation adjustments. I know a lot of folks out there have been convinced that you just zero at 100, and then if the target is farther than 100 yards away, you just hold over and guesstimate. Which you can do to a certain extent, depending on the size of the target and so on and so forth. But the problem with that, there's twofold. There's two problems. Number one, uh you can only get away with that to a certain distance before you start running out of, uh, of hash or um, not hash mark of, uh, well, where's my brain? The crosshairs, reticle, when you run out of reticle. And the other problem with that, and I know that people are like, ah, oh, the Horace reticle. Like, I, I dig you Horace reticle people, but holy crap, man. That's like, there's like so much crap going on. There. Uh, with a normal reticle, if you're, you can just hold over, but what happens when there's wind? Right? What happens when there's wind? Well, what do you mean? I'll just dial for the wind. Oh, you're going to hold up. Let me get, let me guess, let me get this right. So you're going to hold over for elevation and you're going to reach up and you're going to dial for wind. Let me know how that works out for you because <laughs> I'm going to tell you how it's going to work out for you not well the reason that we dial for distance and we hold for wind is because we have a horizontal crosshair we have a horizontal line in our reticle and you can hold on there and you can adjust your wind on there now what do you do if you've got a scope that where the elevation knob has topped out before you get to where you're shooting let's say you want to shoot a thousand or let's say and you say oh that's no big deal you know my my scope dials to a thousand okay uh knowing what i you know don't... now if you don't have a scope that dials to a thousand you probably bought your scope a decade ago or more and today's scopes even the 300 hundred dollar ones will dial out to a uh, thousand yards no problem well the the one that most i got them. in uh most of them the the one that says long range precision. Oh, that, okay, it. that's fair. Yeah, I yeah, guess you was, suppo I suppose you have to kind of know what you're looking for. That was four years ago, and and, and also it yeah, wasn't a cheap scope. It what was it more than three hundred bucks? Really? Yeah, it was from. So the you L can get a three hundred dollar. It was from the from, L company. Okay, so you could yeah. get a three hundred dollar one from the SWFA company, and it that one dialed out to fourteen hundred. Still had six mils left. Yep. So, 
Wow. My point is this, though. We, we all know that they're mechanical. E- even a 30, a 30 tube, a 34 tube, uh, it's just 36 here. I thought the Bushnell Elite was 35. So that's kind of, kind of, hmm. But uh, are you on the site? On the So with yeah. this adjustable inclination mount by Air Attack, what you can do is you can mount your optic in that, max your knob, and then add elevation with by using the the actual mount itself that is interesting yeah and if you if you look close you see that the uh, the knobs have mrad adjustments yeah they have mrad adjustments on the knobs so the so you can add the scope yeah mount you can be adjust it individually in steps of 10 from zero to 70 MOA. Yeah. So that's funny. So that is something. Inclination making change the steps of between five, between zero and 20 MRAD or mils. In steps of five, zero to yeah. 20. Yeah. So, wow. Basically, we're talking these, this is, we're talking if people want to shoot. 14, 15, mile, mile and a half. Uh, but now, when, when you get beyond a mile, that, well, even when you get to them, when you're at a mile, you got to ask yourself, okay, does this cartridge have enough juice mm-hmm. to stay supersonic at a mile? Because if it's not supersonic at a mile, you're just guessing. You're just throwing bullets downrange, hoping one's going to hit. So uh, I, I've got a question for you. Yeah. Since this is a precision rifle, a piece of equipment would you recommend a lever adjustment or a nut adjustment or does it matter you see i was looking at that because i was thinking and... well it's going to go on a scope so i'd probably want to loctite it and use the nut adjustment but then i'm like yeah i mean modern technology seems to be as long as you you uh you loctite it and secure it down you with see the levers. when it says lever adjustment or nut adjustment I'm 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 wondering. Do they mean adjustment, oh, for the elevation? I see yeah. what you're saying. Not for the securing. Not for the the, the securing yeah. it to the because the the. But no, no. But you can see. Uh, yeah, you can see. Let's see. Yeah, we'll have to get one of these and, and give it. A which test. one's more expensive? Okay, the lever's obviously more expensive. Um. Yeah. Here's the deal. I don't see if if you mount this to a rifle, I don't see you pulling it on and off. You know, like, oh, I'm gonna take it off today, put it back on tomorrow, I'll take it off today. But yeah, I don't see that happening. I see this being mounted. I mean, we're talking about super precision stuff here. Uh it's not like a a, a three times magnifier where you're just gonna like, well, I don't need it today, and you take it off. So yeah, I don't see the need to quick change something like this. And you're obviously going to put it on a dedicated rifle, uh, whether it's a 338 or 300 Win Mag or something like that, something with some serious juice on it. Uh, because he, the, here's the thing: you don't need something like this. You don't need for a six Creedmoor. You don't need this for a 308. You, you don't need it for a 270. This They've is tested it up to a 50 BMG. Range. Yeah, Did you see that? This is long. Uh, yeah, this is yeah. long range stuff here. This is, I'm going to shoot beyond a mile or a mile and farther or 1,500 meters and farther. Uh, so if, if you're going to shoot your, your 308 at 800 yards, you don't need this product. Yeah, you don't need this product. If you already have a 34 millimeter scope, you've got enough to dial to it. Now, also keep in mind, though, Jared, we are spoiled. We're spoiled because we get way more out of our bullets at our range than people do, you know, yeah. in, in the, in the lowlands, yeah. we're in the highlands and the people in the lowlands. Uh, and the thing is when you're down in the lowlands, you need more adjustment to go farther because there's more air resistance. There's more atmospheric resistance for the bullet. So you got to put more on, you got to crank and crank and crank and crank. Um, so if you're a pie and that's another reason why, uh, when the, these guys are doing their world record shots, why they they go to Utah? 
not only can they go out to the salt flats and it's, you know, it's, uh, uh, what you call it? It's clear. Flat line of sight. Clear, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. nothing. There's, there's miles not only is there absolutely miles. nothing out there, they're also cheating because they're way up high. You say, well, aren't there places in Texas that are super flat and you can see for miles? Yeah, there are, but they're not 5,000 feet above sea level. No. What's what's Salt Lake? What is the ele- elevation of Salt Lake? 50, 45. 45? Yeah. So it's not like 73, but still, yeah. there's a big difference between 4,500 and, and 100. And now, to be, fair, to be the fair, the further I'll, out you shoot, the more the fundamentals matter. So even if it is cheating with the way the bullet uh, acts in the atmosphere and how, how much further mm-hmm. it'll go, the higher you get, you still have to apply perfect fundamentals. Oh, yeah. You still have to do everything right. Uh, you still have to do everything. And you still have to have, you know, um, I was talking to somebody and they said that a one MOA scope, or not sorry, a one MOA gun seems like a great thing until you're shooting at 1,400 and then you're like, a one MOA at 14, even if you hold perfectly, that's still a 14-inch group. So that that's a potential, that's a lot of margin for error. Uh, a one MOA at 1,000 is a 10-inch group. You're like, that? Like a 10-inch group? Like, 10-inch group is huge. Yeah, I know, but it's 1,000 yards. So when you're talking about long-range precision, your gun should be at least a half MOA gun. You You need to be able to shoot a half MOA or a half inch at 100 yards uh, if you want to, if you expect consistent accuracy and impacts at distance. Um, Let's go ahead. We had a question. And since we're talking about long range shooting, uh, no, there's no better time to do it than right now since we're talking about this. Uh, And you guys, if if you're interested in that product, that was the reason I found it was because I went to the new product section in brownells.com. Went to brownells.com, new product section, and uh, the link is right there in the show notes for you. Uh, I had a question. We had a question from one of our audience members uh, about why do I hate instructors that teach long-range math? Or what's my problem with that? And uh, I want to clarify that. I don't hate that. I, I don't. I don't hate or dislike that. You know, we we joke, we kid around about the Pythagorean theorem and the the bariatric pressure and the the aurora. I've always board. considered that like on the mastery level. Once you get the fundamentals and the basics down, and you want to yeah. know more. Oh yeah, yeah. So, well, here's the thing though. I'm not Paul Markle. I'm not a math teacher. Yeah. Oh, uh, I'm not a math teacher. And people say, well, you know, when, when they come, uh, that's why I don't try to figure out everybody's scopes. You know, when people show up to the classes, uh, even if they all have, well, if they have Milrad, if everybody has a Milrad scope, then it works really well. But we generally that, that in the last class, even yeah, the that was, that was though, affects it. Yeah. And that, that's right. Some people are shooting one, six, eight, one, one, or, you know, we had, we had everybody was using the same scope and you're like, great. So all the dope adjustments are the same. Everything's identical. Nope. <laughs> because not one person was shooting the same caliber. Not one. Everybody had different calibers. So, so, so his, we had two people. It was my rifle and Damon's rifle, which were very, very similar until about 800 that's true. yards. We were actually the same until 800 yards and he was shooting six, five PRC, six, five prick and six, five prick. Yeah, I was shooting six millimeter Creedmoor. Creedmoor. That's a Creedmoor. Yeah. And then we had the ARC, and then we had the 308. Yeah. Uh, but generally what will happen in our classes is, uh, you know, we'll get six, eight, ten people show up, and they'll all have different optics, and they'll all have different adjustments. You'll have the Milrad adjustments. You'll have the half MOA adjustments. You'll have the quarter MOA adjustments. Sometimes somebody will show up with a scope that has a one MOA adjustment. They don't make those. Yes, they do. Don't tell me they don't. I love when people are like, they don't even make those. Okay, I guess this, the scope that was there at the class didn't exist. It must have been a, a fantasy or a unicorn. Uh, and so people say, well, how many clicks, you know, what's my adjustment 
for 500 with this scope. I'm like, I don't know. It's your scope. It's your scope. It's your, you know, first of all, I know what's on mine because I shoot mine. Um, but what ammo are you using? What's the velocity? You know, are you using a, a 155 308? Are you using a 55 grain 223 or a 77 grain 223? Are you shooting a 6.5 Creedmoor? Are you shooting a, you know, what are you, you know, there's so many variables. Bullet speed, bullet design, bullet design. Okay, that's another variable. Uh, is it a standard full metal jacket bullet? You know, is it the, le the least expensive one you get? Or is it a, uh, an OTM? We don't, BTHP, you know. Or is it a tipped match bullet? Yeah. You know, is an ELD bullet from Hornady. There's a lot of variables. And my brain doesn't have the room in it to calculate all of the variables of every possible load and every possible scope that could show up on my range. Uh, and and the, the truth of the matter is, when it comes to calculating that's, that stuff, that's easy. I mean, that's easy. Oh. Uh, if I if I told you today, if I said today, I was like, okay, um, there's a this is this is gun people math. So a case of ammo has fourteen hundred in it, fourteen hundred rounds, and the case uh, price for the case is five hundred and seventy eight dollars. What is the price per round? Would you, if I said that to you right now, I said it's fourteen hundred fourteen hundred rounds in the case, five hundred seventy eight dollars plus shipping. Would you get out a pencil and a piece of paper and start doing long math? Or would you just take your phone, open it, and go boop, 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 and then say, oh, that's X cents per shot. That's a good deal. Would you do that? Yeah, you would do that. And if I said to you, uh, go ahead and work up your dope for whatever range. This elevation, this is the elevation. I'll give you the known factors. The known factors are 7,300 feet above sea level. Boom, that's a known factor. 1,000 yards. Boom, that's a known factor. Okay. Uh, and then you can go crazy, you know. It's 73 degrees out right now. Relative humidity set is 28 if you want to go crazy like that. Uh, and then you put in the other known factors. It's a 168-grain bullet going approximately 2,650 out of the muzzle. All right. Uh, and the height over bore is 1.75 inches. Boom. Put all those things in, hit enter, and it'll give you your adjustments. You say, well, where do I do that? At this point in time, it's 2023. Go to, go to google.com or ancestry.com or, or duckduck.com, <laughs> whatever the hell, <laughs> and type in the word ballistic calculator. Type in the word ballistic calculator. Do you know how many ballistic calculators there are right now? There's a lot. All right. The, the guys at Kestrel, K-E-S-T-R-E-L. Kestrel made a, made a million dollars selling people little handheld who's-its, right? Uh, little handheld whatchamacallits. That, the funny thing is, Jared, uh, you know, bless their hearts. People have like, they're like, that's, that's the sign of a pro is to have a Kestrel on the range because it's got a wind meter on it. You open it up and you hold it and it gives you the, it gives you the exact wind. And then you calculate that, plug that into your, I'm like, cool. Yeah. So that's the exact wind where you're laying on the ground. Right now. Yeah. At this moment in time. What's, what's the wind at the target 1400 yards away? Well, what do you mean? It's the exact same as where I am. It is? Are you sure? Not in Wyoming where we shoot. Not in sure. Wyoming, I it's can not. tell you that. You know, I'm really pl proud. I don't know if I said this the last time we talked about the advanced precision rifle class. But I'm really pl proud. Man, I cannot say that word today. Really proud of the students. Because I am really proud. We did two days of training with zero wind flags. And oh, yeah. We and every guy hits. hits all the time it was just it's fantastic great job guys oh yeah yeah so and, and then part two of this speech and then we'll move on 
in addition to me not being a math instructor or a math teacher, what I am, though, is I am a small arms and tactics instructor. And what I can teach you is I can teach you everything you need to know to f- apply the physical mechanics, the, the pressure to the gun to make the shot go. Uh, I can teach you everything you need to know to put all of your bullets on top of each other at 100 yards. I can teach you that. And what I find with these guys, these instructors out there uh, who want to spend, they they sit the, the new shooter down, right? Not the advanced shooter. They sit the new shooter down, and they start throwing $11 words at them. That's for you, Jay. They start throwing $11 words and $11 phrases at people to make themselves seem smarter. They, they're trying to win. If, if you've got a, a fundamental marksmanship or like, you know, the, our Hepper, uh, where you've got a bunch of shooters that have never shot off the bench beyond 100 yards, and you start throwing in bariatric pressure, you know, Aurora, the, the Coriolis effect, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend... 20, 30 minutes with a whiteboard going over the Pythagorean theorem, you're wasting their time. You are literally stealing the student's time because that stuff right there is that's collegiate level. And where you're at right now is elementary level. Yeah. You uh, master the fundamentals. Yes. Perfect application of those and then move on. Yeah, when you have mastered the fundamentals, when you can't miss, remember, the goal of shooting is not to hit the target because, you know, a retard can hit the target once in a while. A chimp, I could give a chimpanzee a rifle and, and he could hit the target occasionally. He pulls the trigger enough times. The purpose of our training is to get you to the point where not that you can hit the target, so that it's virtually impossible for you to miss because you do everything correctly, consistently, consistently correctly, every single time. And that takes time, and that takes effort, and that takes a lot of mental discipline. And it's, it's hard enough for me to get everybody mentally disciplined to go through the fundamentals, the brass F, the follow through, the all that. It's hard enough for me to get them to do that minus bariatric pressure and Aurora Borealis and, you know, contemplating the Pythagorean theorem. And it's like, like, all right, first of all, the Coriolis effect thing is nonsense. You're like, I, I, and it's like you are, unless you're shooting artillery or, or, you know, intercontinental ballistic missiles if you're shooting a 65 creedmoor at 500 yards the freaking Coriolis effect has nothing has no effect on on what you're doing not at all stop worrying about all these 12 dollars phrases and 11 dollars words and focus on the fundamentals focus on what's really important and, and as far as the math goes it's 2023. We have supercomputers that can figure the math out. I mean, if, if you are, if you really, really, really have to be able to sit down with a pencil or maybe you're like, you know, um, what was that movie with Matt Damon and, and, uh, and Robin Williams where he, I give you a piece of chalk and a, and a great big green chalkboard and you can sit there and, you know, yeah. If you want a goodwill hunting, there you go. That just came to me. If you want a goodwill hunting, all the formulas and stuff, that's cool. Dude, that is awesome. Do that. Get yourself a, a big green chalkboard and some chalk and, and you can goodwill hunting that stuff all you want. But I'm telling you that, that well, there's a there's time investment. And your time investment is better off spent shooting the gun and focusing on the fundamentals and just let the machine figure out the numbers or like i said if you if you really really have to goodwill hunting it then go for it all right day so according to my show notes (laughs) uh, we don't need to do that one right there because uh 
we're going to do a lot of that. So J-U-X-X-I, that's juicy.com. Did I shame you freaks um, enough last week that you went over and you followed us at juicy.com? Did I, did I or, or did I need to shame you more? I got a text you message know? from a gentleman who was talking about him being shamed and that he was going to fix himself. So my question to you, sir, is did you fix yourself? There you go. Honesty check. Uh, honesty check. Did you sh- fix yourself? You know, we're always complaining. We're always crying. Our The gun industry, the, the, the gun culture gun community, we're always crying. We're like, oh, man, you know, the... The derp derp the the YouTube and the and the Google and then they're all censoring us. I'm like, yeah, I know. So we created a platform. Well, not we, not me, but there's uh, they created a platform that is not Google. And here, here's all right. This is something that I need to bring up. You say, well, all right. So it's there. So people are just going to find it. No, here's the deal. The trick is or the the is when you don't use Google and you don't use YouTube at to support your videos. See if you use Google and YouTube to support your videos, then you become part of their algorithm. You become part of their promotion, right? Google is never going to promote Juxy. You know, Google and Google owns YouTube. Um, there, it's never. They are never going to send out f- ads and promotion to get people to watch Juxy. The only way for Juxy, an independent video platform, to survive, is for you to do it. That's the only way they can survive. The only way they can survive is if the end user takes the time to not only join but share because google will never share anything from juicy they'll never promote it they'll never share it because it's a competing entity and we talked about this yeah last week but you don't have to create an account to watch the videos just go there and watch the videos you can support your content creators there by watching their content you don't even have to give juicy your email address no how righteous is that you just share it, you know, just share the link. You guys are, you're smart enough to know how to share a freaking link, right? I Juicy hope so. put a, a button on the, each video that says share and you can share it super yeah. easy. So the, the latest, greatest, hottest video uh, that is on juxxi.com right now is the, is my review of the Eat Cannon. That's right. The actual YC9, <laughs> the redesigned one, not the, not the C9 that has a threaded barrel, but the actual new YC9 Yeet Cannon with the threaded barrel. And, and, and you say, well, what, what's all the deal? Well, watch the video. There you go. All right. Bada, 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 boom, bada, boom. This is when I be quiet and Zach plays the mid roll or whatever it is. <laughs> Attention, new listeners. We produced a complimentary online training course called Seven Training Tips That Could Save Your Life. Get instant access by joining the Student Lounge for free at studentofthegun.com. Do you watch Student of the Gun TV, read the blog, and follow us on Facebook? If you answered no to any of these questions, you are wrong, but you can easily fix yourself. Go to studentofthegun.com to find everything SOTG. All right. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Go to studentofthegun.com for all of your needs. And uh, you can go to studentofthegun.com. Go to studentofthegun.com slash culture. Culture. Would, would I be, do I need to have my pinky out when I'm doing that? If I go to studentofthegun.com, have my pinky out or culture. Studentofthegun.com slash culture. Because if you go there, well, then you'll find out who it is, who is it, who it is that is offering the SOTG promo codes. That's right. Uh, who is offering the SOTG promo code? That'd be Defiant Munitions, My Topo, Crossbreed, Brown Elves, Frog Lube. And then you know, we're hoping to add more to the list soon. And maybe if you guys support that, um, 
yeah, you'll be able to do that. You know, Jared, uh, going back to the whole long range thing and so forth, I, I, I read when I was a younger man, uh, when I was a younger man, Carlos Hathcock was still alive uh, and uh, read the book 93 Confirmed Kills. And one of the things that I took from Hathcock, Hathcock was a master level shooter. Uh, he won the thousand yard Wimbledon Cup match. And uh, he obviously had 90, at least, you know, 93 confirmed kills. And when you say confirmed kills, what does that mean? Does that mean he shot 93 people? Actually, what it means is he shot way more than 93 people. But you don't, it's unless they actually recover a body uh, and there are witnesses to the recovered body, you don't get credit for it. You're like, what? You're like, but I saw it fall. I'm like, well, yeah, but then, you know, then. That was the uh, that was part of the problem when, in Vietnam uh, was that uh, we were trying to do a body count war, not a territory war, and those things are different. And because we were trying to do a body count war, not a territory war, the Vietnamese would always drag off their dead and wounded uh, so that we couldn't get the confirmed kills. You know, oh, uh, and it was demoralizing. It was demoralizing for the troops to fire you know, 5,000 rounds and then it's all over with and they go walk into the jungle and they find nobody. And they're like, did we didn't do anything? What we, we didn't accomplish anything. You know, we got four dead people in our platoon here and, and, uh, we fired 5,000 rounds and we go into the jungle and we find nothing. Um, but, uh, getting back to Hathcock, he said when, People discovered or they, they realized, especially post-Vietnam, when he become kind of semi-famous, you know, he was famous in the community. So they would ask him rifle questions, like rifle-specific questions. You know, it's like, like what, what, what kind of uh, crown, what kind of barrel muzzle crown is on your, you know, 300 wind mag or whatever, or your 30-out six, and, you know, what's the, the – and, and he's like, dude, I shoot the guns. He said, I shoot the guns. I don't build the guns. It's like a race car driver who drives the car, but doesn't build the engines. Like there, there are dudes that build the engines and they, and you can ask them all about the timing and the, this and the compression and everything he goes, he goes, I, you know, I've got this round thing and there's pedals on the floor. I push those pedals and I turn this round thing and I make car go fast. I don't build car. And Hathcock was the same way. It's like, I don't, I don't build the rifles. I shoot the rifles. And they're like, yeah, but, you know, you shoot them really well. You should know all about the, the intricate details of the construction of the and it's like, No, that's not how it is. Now, I know a little bit about the intricate details, of the, but there are people that know way more than me. You know, the bedding and the... And the, you know, how many, how many foot pounds of torque to put on the locking lug and the, or the recoil lug and the, you know, stuff like that. And I'm like, cool, cool story, bro. Uh, I trust you. It's like when, uh, my buddy, uh, David Rooney was building rifles for me. He's telling me all about how he did it. And I'm like, you just keep doing that. And yeah. I'm just going to keep, I'll just keep putting the rounds right on top of each other. And you just keep building them like that and we'll be good. We'll be good. So there you go. All right. So Zachary, did you want to hit some uh, hit the uh, the audience up with some information? Uh yes, indeed. I can let you know. Uh, should I play the video? I'll play the video real quick. Well, it's that it's that time for it Zach to time. talk and me to be quiet. It just feels like we just played one. But hey, my videos are great, so screw it. ShopSOTG.com is the perfect place to go if you are a student of the gun. Whether you want to expand your brain increase your marksmanship, or help keep your family safe. All that, plus the Pimp Hand brands that you love. ShopSOTG.com has almost anything that an American patriot would want. Education, enlightenment, and entertainment, and we're open 24-7. Check out ShopSOTG.com today and see for yourself. Yes, indeedy do, and I just want, want to, we kind of touched on it earlier, but I want to remind you that right now on ShopSOTG.com, you can, uh, pre, I guess it's kind of a pre-order, but like a 
order, and then it'll get sent as soon as we have it in hand. The new Pipe Hitter's Guide from Nicholas Orr, which is the small, uh, the guide to small arms and weapons. And in addition to that, you can, of course, get the other three highly acclaimed and highly beloved installments in the Pipe Hitter's Guide uh, series. So shop at TG.com, get all the Pipe Hitter's Guides, including the brand new one that just got made official, or not made official, made public, uh, what, Saturday? Mm, I'm not sure what day it was. But Very recently. It is. It is. <laughs> it's yeah. a brand new book. Head over there. Is it? Yeah. Get your book. It is. Get your book. Get all four. It's great. Yeah. So there you go. You should. You should have all four. All right. So uh, that is that. That's that, Mister. That's that. And uh, we're going to go into the student of the gun homeroom brought to you by CrossbreedHolsters.com. And it's always about being dangerous on demand. But before we do that, my question to you is. Whose responsibility is your safety? Is it the popo or is it yours? I don't know. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and preface this. You remember someone who looks a lot like this guy right here who has been warning you who's been telling you that our traditional institutions in the united states have been under deliberate attack and deliberate assault the united states military has been under deliberate attack from within not from without not from the chai coms or the ruskies or the iranians or the iraqis or whatever no the united states military has been under attack by our own government for at least 10 years, going on 12 years now. Uh, The United States police, you know, the the policing, the law enforcement agencies, whether it's a sheriff's department or a municipal department or what have you, have been under attack for a long time now. Actually, they they started in the 1990s. It It was incremental with the the Clinton administration, when they decided, when the federal government decided to start meddling with municipal police agencies. You're like, how does that? You say, but Paul, the the federal government doesn't have any authority over your local municipal police department. There's nowhere in the Constitution of the United States that grants it the authority to go to Millersburg, Ohio, and dictate to them who they hire, you know, how they hire, you know, whatever. You're right. You're right. That is that is correct. But what they did in the 90s with the crime bill is they said, we're going to spend federal money to hire more police officers. Yay! 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 Oh, yay! Oh, man, that's so great. And people who weren't colossal idiots raised their hand and said, that's a terrible idea. It is a terrible idea for local agencies to take federal tax handouts. Why? Because what always comes with it, Jared? Oh, strings, for sure. Strings, stipulations. It's like it is no different than the street corner heroin dealer or methamphetamine dealer or whatever that gives you either free or discount or whatever, right? First one's free. The rest of them aren't, though. That's how, that's how drug dealers, that's how pushers work. That's how drug dealers have worked for forever is they get you hooked on it and then they own you. And that's exactly what the federal government did. They're, they're like, oh, we have all this federal grant money for your little agency only has so much money. Well, don't worry about it. Just fill out this paperwork and get this federal grant and you can hire more cops and you can pay for overtime and you can do all this. Blah, 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 blah. And there and, and, you know, human beings being what they are stupid short-sighted and i saw this crap in the 90s i saw 
You're like, oh, you'd be stupid not to take people. This is what people say. Oh, you'd be stupid not to take the money. I mean, everybody else is taking the money. It's 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 there for the taking. And then what happens? Either one of two things happens. Either the money runs out or they change the program. Let's say you hire a bunch of people because, the, oh, man, the, the, the Clinton crime bill provided umpteen million dollars for, for local law enforcement, which is not the, the or number one. At the very top of it, it's a crime. It's criminal because it's a violation of the Constitution. The Congress has no authority to steal the money from the people of the United States and redistribute it to local municipal police departments. They have no constitutional authority to do that. It is theft. They're breaking the law when they do it. Yeah, but they all went into a room and they voted. So if, if they all vote to break the law, then it's, then it's okay? Yeah. Well, now that you put it that way, I mean, it's, when you put it that way, it sounds bad. But when you put it the other way, like they want to they wanna increase community policing and ba da da ba da da ba da 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 and uh, I had some, I actually had some smart friends in, in the '90s who were in law enforcement, and uh, one of them was the on the was a pretty hype dude on the sheriff's department, and he's like, he said that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. He said the money is is there for X, like I don't know how long it was for like one year, or twenty four months, or something like that. Then it ends. He said, so what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to go out and hire more employees. Get them on the on the payroll, right? Use that free money to pay their salary, and then when it poof, disappears, we have to the the municipality or the county or whatever has to come up with the money to or or lay those people off, and then and then you know then we become the a holes are like oh man what are you doing how are, why are you are firing police officers. So that it becomes this never-ending quest for more money. So that started in the 90s. Those of you who don't know, that's the destruction of American law enforcement This started in the 90s. That's how long it's been going on. Well, and it's gone through a bunch of different phases. You know, we went from the federal government saying, we need more money for local police. Well, this story here from AmmoLand.com is from our good buddy. Did you see who, are, who wrote it, Jared? Oh, yeah. Yeah, our buddy John Farnham. Now, there is, a, there is a, uh, um, there's a video that goes with it, and uh, the story is Los Angeles police shortage is no surprise in liberal strongholds. So we went from the gov- federal government saying, hey, get on these federal grants because we want you to have more local policing. We want you to have more cops. But if you take our money, here's a list of demands. These are, these are the, you, if you take our money, you got to have so many black people and so many, and so many females and so many Asians and Latinos and, and derp, derp, derp. You, you, here's, here's yeah, our EEOC. Those are the best people for the job. Didn't you know that? Mm-hmm. Here's our EEOC the best demands. For the job. Are we though? Well, we've yeah. seen the, see, this is the, the Minneapolis. Issue. This is the conundrum that I run into because I've only been paying attention as an adult for, like 10 or 15 years now. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, it's been 15 years. So there's that. But also, um, I don't have knowledge of, uh, I haven't done enough studying of the police force and what, what, you know, what it came from and what made it a good police force. And this is where your expertise comes in and you can lend your expertise to the listeners. And I'm just a dude that's here to ask questions to, to help clarify for those of us that haven't been, yeah. A police officer you know dad was a police officer for a, what two decades yeah so you've been there you've done that you've kind of seen the transition the t-shirt of the yeah. police force so the question that i have for you is is the police force of today or even when you were coming to the end of your tenure as a 
a police officer, was the, the police force that you experienced at the end better or at, equivalent to or worse than the police force that you, when you joined the police force? Well, you know, it, it also, you have to go back to like, what do you expect police to do? What do you expect cops to do? Oh, uh, that's a great question. I think that's a, uh, when society wants cops, around. yeah, they want cops to be social workers. They want them to do everything. They yeah. want them to, you know, people, there's an issue, take care of it. Yeah. Come raise my children. My kids aren't behaving. Uh, you need to fix them. Yeah. I experienced that. Uh, the truancy or the dis, you know, the discipline problems. And they're like, you know, they dispatch to the house and why? Because the, the 13 year old is, you know, this or that. And I'm like, what? I, what? No, no, That's I'm not here to raise your kids. Uh, you know, if you, if your kid screws up and he vi breaks the law or steals or whatever, then we'll refer him to the juvenile authorities. And then that's a big old mess itself. But, you know, people, you know, they, they, they expect police officers to be social workers. It's, it's like the you expecting the army to be the Peace Corps. You know, the, the United States Army is not supposed to be the freaking Peace Corps. The job of the military is to break stuff and kill people, to kill people and break stuff. And to do that really well in defense of the nation. That's it. It's not to not to go and dig wells and hand out pillows and give meals and you know the National Guard can do that, but the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, their job is to kill people and break stuff super effectively so that the enemies of of America don't want to screw with us. That's their job. And police officers are supposed to be there to stop or catch criminals that's it right not to be freaking officer friendly not to be freaking uh you're, you know and then that's the you know societies communities started expecting cops to be oops there we go i i knew that was going to happen social workers they're not supposed to be social workers you know police officers and and, and they're also not supposed to be tax collectors that's another thing that these municipalities have done is they've decided, and <clears throat> state police, uh, they've decided that the state police or you know whoever are going to be tax collectors. They're going to be revenue generation. They're not supposed to be revenue generation. Law enforcement officers aren't supposed to be there to generate revenue for the, the community coffers. But what happens when you when you become when you have this situation where they're in, in a constant desire for money? You got these agencies that are constantly seeking more money, more money, more money, more money, more money, more money, more money. So what happens when you do that? Your cops turn into you know tax collectors. You turn your cops into tax collectors. And the, and the bigger the city, the worse it is. Started handing out jaywalking tickets. I didn't even know that was a thing. I thought that was like a joke. I thought that was something that they talked about on movies or whatever until I was in uh, San Diego. And my buddy, we, 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 we ran across the street, right? Like how many times when you were growing up, if you needed to get across the street, did you stop, look both ways, and run across the street? Well, in San Diego... If you don't cross at an intersection with the light, then the police see you, they give you a ticket. They give you a jaywalking ticket. You're like, what? Like, so you're telling me I'm not allowed? Yeah, you're not allowed to walk there. And it's revenue collection. That's all it is. It's revenue collection. It's tax collecting. They're turning the cops into tax collectors. They're like, no, Paul, they're keeping you safe. It's their job. To this, is when, this is when idiots say, it's the police's job to keep you safe. No, it's not. I, I need to go back to the, I was waiting for a good time to jump in and give some comedic relief here. You know why you got, or your buddy got arrested or a ticket for jaywalking? Why? Because the the name of jaywalking, you know where it came from. It came from a J used to be a slang term for something like a a redneck, basically. 
somebody that didn't understand the rules of a city, quote unquote. So it's it's because he came from, I don't know if you guys grew up together, but he came from where you grew up from, you you darn hicks. How dare you <laughs> set foot in the cities? Is that is that go back to Jayhawk? Uh I don't know how far back it went, but I, I looked this up like it's funny that you bring up jaywalking because mm-hmm. I was having a conversation with somebody had about a couple months ago at this point, and I was like, "Where does jaywalking?" Because I th- I thought that it was like the letter J, mm-hmm. and I'm like, "Well, that I did too." Sense yeah, you go in a straight line. Yeah, so, so I like, looked it mean, up, and you, it was basically like you cross and then you hook back halfway. Yeah, that, that's what I thought because you know I'm, I'm I'm dumb and uneducated sometimes, but uh, not dumb, just ignorant. But so I, I looked it up, and it was something of the sort like it was a slang term for a redneck or something like that. Yeah. So, there you go. There you go. You dumb hicks don't know how to cross the street properly. Yeah. All right. Let's check Zach. Hick. Go ahead and that's play the, the word it was using hick. So yeah. play this, uh, play the video that's uh, accompanies a story. And then Jared will um, talk about what our buddy, John Farnham has to say. should not be police officers lapd officers and la city personnel it's a danger it's a it's a direct danger to the public people directly involved in the lapd recruiting and hiring process are going public for the first time with their concerns we're just letting the floodgates open to people that shouldn't be on the job most of our sources asked us to protect their identities for fear of retaliation but not james williams he supervised lapd police backgrounds for 20 years williams retired a year ago i have nothing to gain from this but it's the right thing to do prosecute the police after the death of george floyd in minneapolis in 2020 followed by massive protests across the country and anti-police sentiment. Williams alleges the LAPD began making changes in its recruiting process. We were given direction to uh, focus more on diversity candidates, which we always have. Regardless of the candidate, the good ones always flow to the top. But he says if the top tier candidates were not from a specific minority group, they didn't want them, so they they sat on the shelf. I myself am a minority, and I completely believe in diversity in the department because that's what makes Los Angeles a great city. But we need to hire good. <sighs> now that that right there, that crap, that is that's brainwashing. That is that is mental conditioning. I have to say this: I believe in diversity. Why? Diversity is our strength. No, it's not. Diversity is not our strength. Freedom is our strength. Liberty is our strength. Strength is our strength. But diversity is not our strength. And that right there, I'm sorry to jump in here, but I can't let that crap go. That is freaking, that's conditioning. This guy has been conditioned. He has been brainwashed to feel like he has to say that. Yeah, I have to say this. You don't stop parroting this freak, these liberal talking points. All right, continue. Qualified candidates that can do the job. They started manipulating the standards and the guidelines, which that was a major issue with me. The hiring standards are created by POST, the Commission on Peace Officers Standards and Training. Candidates have to go through the peace officer selection process that includes a written exam, physical ability test, and background investigation. All law enforcement agencies in California must abide by those guidelines if they want certification for their academies and officers. They wanted to go below those. Can't do that. It's illegal. We're governed by uh, post standards. We're governed by government codes as well. Williams claims it didn't matter to the department. He and other sources say the LAPD is making it too easy to be an officer because of a staffing crisis. They're not waiting for the best possible candidate to come by. Almost feels like they don't have that time to do it. They want to meet the numbers now. So what were the standards before compared to now? So the physical fitness qualifier, you're supposed to have at least a 50% to get into the academy. Uh, We're now hiring people with 40, 30, and in some cases, lower than 10% physical scores. What they're doing is not helping. They're creating doubt 
in the public's mind. Chief Michael Moore says the LAPD is not lowering the standards, but the hiring practices of have course evolved he is. through the years. When you're eliminating He's a people. politician. Uh, but listen to what he says about running a mile and a half in, in 12 minutes. To be Jerry, a could you run a mile and a half in 12 minutes? Because you can't run a mile and a half in 12 minutes. Uh, you got to ask yourself, when's the last time an officer ran a mile and a half? And understand, it, is that still relevant? Our sources say the written exam is a lot easier because now it's a multiple choice test. The written exam, we've had that test for years. And since I've gotten there, they've, uh, they've eased up on the, uh, the standards of that written exam. We moved to a multiple question test in place of a narrative because we saw that the narratives were, were judged subjectively. They were not consistent as far as people who passed or who didn't pass. In the past, a background investigation revealing a candidate's bad credit or financial problems could have resulted in rejection. Not anymore. Williams, who used to be a cop for a different agency before becoming a background investigator and supervisor, says it's dangerous to hire people with money problems. People that are in deep financial problems often are tempted by money. The temptations out there on patrol are vast. You may pull over a drug dealer with hundreds of thousands of dollars. If you hire somebody without integrity, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to steal. I do worry about mean like officers the who would fall prey to bribery. The reality is that, unfortunately, this profession and this own department in the past decades have had those individuals with what I guess those same critics would say a more stringent standard. Well, if it was such a stringent standard and it was so great, how did those failures occur? Chief Moore strongly denies the allegations that recruiters are told to focus on specific minority candidates, even if they're not qualified. We do not hire a person on the basis of their race or their gender. But at the same yes, time, you do. we are Quit lying. pursuing qualified applicants that are representative of the diversity of this city. All right, go ahead and stop. Go ahead stop. Go and stop. Go ahead and stop. All right, he's a liar. I can tell you he's a liar because I've been there. Uh, not an LAPD, but I, all right. He's a liar because I know this is what happened. In 1995, when the federal government stuck its nose hardcore into all, muni like all municipal policing, all right, LAPD gets federal money. Guarantee it, right? And part of federal money says you have to have this many minorities, women. It, now it could be anything. People who think they're cats, dudes who think they're chicks, chicks who think they're dudes, you know, furries. What, dude, how long is it going to be before you get pulled over by officer furry? Because they can't deny them. They've got a butt plug with a freaking, with a freaking tail sticking out of it, right? You're going to get pulled over by officer furry. Go ahead. Tell me I'm wrong. Okay. I love that. People are getting pulled over by by freaking trannies and freaking transvestites and lunatics right now. Okay, when I was, it, it went so far when I was taking civil service exams in the 90s. You got bonus points for being a minority. So just for showing up and writing your name on a piece of paper, if you were black, or, or whichever one was favored at the time back then it was you know my, now it might be Muslims or Latinos or whatever and a woman on on the on the freaking notifications it said Africa for the the test the municipal test right the civil service exam for Canton Ohio Police Department on the test it said African Americans and women are strongly encouraged to apply. What what even all right in a sane world, what even does that mean? Nobody had to strongly encourage me to apply. It's like, well, I wasn't gonna go take the test, but I saw the flyer and it said strongly encouraged. And how did they strongly encourage them? They got bonus points 
for being black or women. And if you're a black woman, you got lots of bonus points. You got more points than a honky. So if you were a U.S. military veteran, physically fit honky, and you were a big old fat black chick from Canton or Akron or Cleveland or whatever, you got 15 more points just for signing your name on the, on the test than that dude did. So don't give me some walking bull crap, Chief Moore. Uh, we, we do it higher based on uh, sex or minority or gender. or anything. We only hire the best people. No, you don't. No, you don't. And I'll tell you why you don't. Because the, quote, best people don't want to be cops. Why would you? We've been talking about this for years. People who are motivated, self-starters, independent-minded, okay, don't need a system to, you know, help them succeed. They can succeed on their own. Those people don't want to be cops. Why would they want to be cops? I don't want to be a cop. No. Because you're you're what, always what wrong. What's kind of confusing to me is uh that you're saying this was in the nineties, right? Yeah. So at this point this in started. time, it's been well, it's the twenty twenty, so it's been twenty years. And if you look at the way that the media portray, portrays the minority groups, whoever they assign it to, mm -hmm. has it been thirty years? Thirty. Oh my gosh. Thirty years. Yeah, that, that whole thing of aging happens. But yeah. so the the way that the media portrays minority groups nowadays is that they they still need help and oh, they're, they're put upon now than they've ever and, been before. Oh yeah. But this is true. Systemic and, racism because we, we have proof from somebody that was there and it was happening. Then wouldn't the minority groups or shouldn't they? If this in fact did work and gave them more opportunity and it was instead of enabling them to uh, continue with the status quo and be rewarded for it anyway, wouldn't this mean that the minor minority groups that were targeted in this instance to, to let them have jobs, not based upon merit, but based upon the color of their skin or the sex that they are, wouldn't that mean mm -hmm. that those people would be better off today? than they were 30 years ago, 30 years later. Well, and here's the thing, the same liberals that were, were burning down cities talking about, you know, all cops are bastards. Hey, dipstick, uh, the all cops are bastards in, in the nineties, they started filling the ranks of police based on EEOC standards. If the cops all suck, they suck because you made them that way. You got what you wanted. What does liberalism always do? Generates what? Yep, the exact so the opposite intent. of its stated intent. Yep. So, the, the, you know, the people that are decrying the police. Listeners that are listening to us right now that are liberals. And if you disagree with that statement, I would love you to send us some information, some proof where the liberal, the, the way that liberalism is and the way that it causes people to think actually was successful and made life better. You know, they can't. Well, if they, if they, they can only can, support their argument with emotion, we'll talk. You're about a it. racist. You're a homophobe. You're a, a, a xenophobe. You know, whatever. I, I can't uh, wait for terms that are thrown around to get you out of critically thinking about the issue is what that Yo. is. And we've it's said that for a long time too. Yeah. Dude, dude, uh, use Merlu. All right. Let's see what Farnham has to say. Go into the story, Zach or Jared. John Farnham is a hell of a dude. My, my very first firearms, professional firearms instructor, uh, the guy who put me on the path, John Farnham. Los Angeles police shooting is no surprise in liberal shortage. Homes. Oh, sh not short. What did I say? You said police shooting shortage. <laughs> Los wow. That's that mind control stuff works. <laughs> Los Angeles police shortage is no surprise in liberal strongholds. This is August 11th by John Farnham. And at the top, it says opinion. 
So there you go. Uh, this is a quote from Thomas Sowell. He says, quote, so, civil rights used to be about treat civil rights used to be about treating everyone the same, but today some are so used to be to special treatment that the equal treatment is considered discrimination. Any who champions diversity needs to be asked how many conservatives serve on the LA city council anti-police slash anti-policing sentiment among far left activists, i.e. communists, many of whom sit on the LA city council and tacitly get an ad pop up. So anti-police, anti-policing sentiment among far left activists and tacitly supported by Democrats and most of the media has manufactured a crisis of policing in LA and many other metro areas. Current LAPD chief Michael Moore is reluctantly reporting LAPD's complement of sworn officers has now dropped below 9,000 officers for the first time since the 1990s. The city's budget calls for 9,300 sworn officers from a high of 9,900 in 2010, but hiring is going poorly. Understandably, no one wants to be a cop. Even with the lowered hiring standards, the current recruit class has only 25 candidates. Wow. In L.A. Wow. L.A. has how many million people? Wow. Like, that's How many crazy. million people are in L.A.? Like eight or something like that? 25, right. not 25,000 or 2,500. 25. Wow. As a Los result, Angeles there are has no longer enough patrolmen mil- and detectives to handle petty crimes. Wow, this is interesting. So there's 3.8 million people in the greater Los Angeles, California area, 3.8 million. And so for 3.8 million, oh my gosh, there's 9,000 so cops. So this hiring class, what do they call it? Academy. No, the current recruit, recruit class, 25 candidates is point zero 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 six five percent of the population so congrats on being the less than half percent guys i'm sorry the less than one percent the less than what point one percent less than what point zero one percent holy cow yeah in practical terms this means that when you call the police in la for anything short of life-threatening forcible felony in progress they're not coming which is just go off on a side tangent real quick. This is kind of mind blowing. It's mind bottling is what it is. When you put yeah, your thoughts, it's in like a when your thoughts are trapped in a bottle. Yeah. It's mind bottling because if you think about the restrictions that the city of LA puts on their, on the people, quote unquote citizens, they, they can't, they basically can't defend themselves. You don't need to carry a gun. That's why we have nine one one. Just call the police. That's their job. The operator will curtly tell you, to go to their webpage and file a report online. Fi- go to the website and file a report. That'll fix it. Wow, I've never seen this word in life before. So um, John always uses these these words that are... John is an prolific. educated human. Yes, he is very educated. And if you haven't taken a class from this gentleman, do it soon. Hurry up. Because I don't know how much longer before he retires from this... He's not going to retire. He's going to die on the range. He already said so. that is true. Yes, that is what he said. He's like, I'm not going to. He he's not retiring. So, if you're a student in that class, it'll be an interesting story that you'll have. But um, yeah, yeah. If you, um, I, I'm trying to get to my point here. If you haven't taken training from John Farnham, please do it because the tactics aside, if you throw out everything he teaches about tactics, which are are really good, by the way, if you throw out all that stuff, it is worth sitting there. And listening to him pontificate. He's all right. John Farnham it's so is cool. he's gen two. Oh, uh, he, he's a, he's a second generation. So we, we talked about this and, and I, I need to write this down. I need to get Ken Hackathorn's um, and I did John too. Their thoughts about this, like first generation post-World War II, you had Ray Chapman and you had uh, Weaver, and you had Cooper, right? You had the the uh, the original gun site and, and the American Pistol Academy and so forth. 
our American Pistol Institute. And then you had the people who showed up there to become instructors. So, the, and so you had Hackathorn, Clint Smith, John Farnham, and a lot of guys who are gone now. Um, you know, uh, Louis Auerbuck is gone. Uh, who else is gone? Somebody just passed away. But you got, so you, the, you had your first generation guys, Cooper, right? World War II veterans. And then you had your second generation guys, Vietnam veterans. You had your, your Farnham Marine Corps Vietnam veteran, uh, you know, uh, John and uh, Clint Smith, Marine Corps Vietnam veteran. Well, then, so that's Gen 2. Then you have Gen 3, the people who sat at the feet. So first you had people sat at the feet of Cooper. And then you have the people who sat at the feet of the people who sat of uh, Cooper, which was me, right? My generation, the, the Cold War guys. So, so you know, uh, I, I guess basically, so John is second generation American firearms trainer, and I'm third generation American firearms trainer. But John's been, he's been there doing that, seeing the elephant since the 70s. Turn your microphone on. Oh, yeah, I was just agreeing with you. And, yeah. and he, when when he teaches, he's a great instructor. And uh, but in addition to that, in addition to being a great instructor, the stories that that man has, he'll just pull something out and, and throw it at you in class, and you're like, I did not expect to get that kind of education while I was here. Mm. Uh, you want me to continue the story? Thus beleaguered. Yep. Thus, thus beleaguered. beleaguered LA residents who are still paying ridiculously high first world taxes in exchange get to live in a third world sewer. What a deal. In the 1990s, Mayor Rudy Giuliani in NYC warned that when a window in a building is broken and left unrepaired, all the rest of the windows will soon be broken. Petty crimes, vandalism, graffiti, burglary, public begging, squatting, illegal drug use, prostitution, filth, when not dealt with, promptly and appropriately quickly digress into out of control major crimes there is no debating this yep it's absolutely true and this is exactly what we're currently seeing in portland seattle atlanta minneapolis chicago philadelphia baltimore and yes la as a result people especially the productive are fleeing these liberal manufactured sewers as quickly as possible of course they're giuliani racist would, yeah of course giuliani was viciously ridiculed and scored by Democrats and their media commissioners, commissars. commissars. Yet under Giuliani, NYC was the safest and cleanest big city in America, in the world, and people wanted to live there. Yep. Today, they're all fleeing NYC too. Yep. For the same reasons. No society has ever thrived because it had a large and growing class of parasites living off those who produce. That's Thomas Sowell again. Thomas Sowell again. All right, there you go. That's that. We've said it. There's more proof. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and this is we threw this into the uh, university section, student again university, I'm sorry, student again homeroom, uh, because homeroom is always about being dangerous on demand. And you're going to have to be dangerous on demand because the police are not here. And even if the, even let's just say they wanted to, protect you they can't they can't Nine thousand cops in a city of 3.8 million people the good and, thing is there are plenty of inexpensive options for uh self-defense pistols nowadays so that's true you can get one that's We're true about but you can, about it. and in la you you can get one you can't carry it you can't have it on your body without a special permission from the commissar, and yeah, that you're ain't not allowed happening. to do that. Yep. And you even have a chief of police who uh, remember during COVID when the when the chief was sent his cops out to shut down all the gun stores, or is it the sheriff who sent the sent them out to shut down all the gun stores? Because you don't need guns. All right, there's a crisis, and you don't need guns. All right, let's talk about the Yeet Cannon. Let's get to Yeeting. We don't we don't have the. Uh, what you just said is even more reason to go buy one of these right now. <laughs> you might not be able to get one when your chief of police shuts down your gun shop. Yeah, the liberator. Well, waiting until a crisis to run to the gun store to buy a gun is the, the stupidest crap. You know, Americans do 
well, humans. Humans do stupid things. Oh, there's a hurricane brewing. Yeah, I know. They've been reporting on it for two weeks. Yeah, but it's it's 24 hours from making landfall. I better run to Walmart and and stand in line with a thousand other people to, to buy the last can of beans or whatever. That's stupid. Well, if you're smart, then you can run to Walmart with the yeet cannon on your hip. Or you just don't go. There's that. You don't go. Uh, but, yeah, what is the deal? Uh, Jared, I'll let, you, I'll let you give first impressions. Give first uh, impressions. For- so first impressions of the Yeet Cannon, the High Point YC9, the Yeet Cannon. Uh, my first impressions before I shot it were that the uh, the mag release needed a little bit of work. However, it fixed itself with some shooting. So what we did is we lubed it up with some frog lube, took it to the range, ran some rounds through it. That thing ate basically everything. Um, there, it's It's funny. Dad will tell you about the specifics of of what it ran, but I was impressed with the medley of different things that it would actually accept because this is a sub $300 gun. Mm. And some of the changes that they made, uh, you can actually mount a red dot on this sucker now, which is really cool. And uh, a threaded barrel, it's got the the pick rail on the front. Um, man, what else? The trigger's pretty dang good. It, it the, has a pretty good trigger. Yeah, yeah I'm impressed. Uh, it's good. so we've got the optics that you can mount on there, the threaded barrel, the pick rail. Uh, that's completely redesigned frame as well. Redesigned it's pretty dang good in your hand. So I, I highly recommend that you, if you have a gun shop that's close to you, ask them if they can get one as a rental gun so that you can go try it out. Because that's how you do it. <laughs> guys, come on, just get me a yeet cannon oh, to try out that's before this. I buy. Oh man! So, oh, the sights back up. Oh, they got. They must have been prepared for it. Oh, they were on so it. The, yeah, they were on it. Yeah, the, the <laughs> success, it was success because it broke the website. Yeah. So the first thing this morning, it was down. Yeah, first thing this morning, it was down because, uh, yeah, let's see. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it has a redesigned slide, which doesn't look like the. Uh, it has the the grooves uh, in it. it. Has a redesigned frame which has a grip safety, which is weird um, that they would do that. I don't even, I didn't even ask them why, but the grip safety is so unobtrusive that if somebody didn't point it out to you and tell you that it was there, you might not even know. You, you might not even realize that it was there. Uh, yeah. The threaded barrel is half by 28. Uh, has a high impact polymer frame, aggressive texturing, blah blah blah. Plus P rated. Um, it has a. It, it's they they uh, they suffer from uh, I think lawyeritis a little bit. Uh, they've got the uh, because they've got a magazine disconnect safety which they've always had, and they got a magazine disconnect safety. They have a manual safety, and then they also have a grip safety. Uh, so. There's that. But uh, the guns run. Now, here's what I discovered. Now, when Jared and I, the first day we had the pistol, we went to the range. uh, And we were actually, we were preparing for a rifle class. So it wasn't really pistol time. It was rifle time. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we we scrounged up a bunch of uh, ball ammo and shot that. and, And we shot, and it was like wolf. Our Tula, we had a bunch of Wolf and Tula, and, and uh, we shot that. And then we also had some uh, high, uh, some Black Hills Honey Badger, um, which is the exact opposite. It's the Black Hills Honey Badger, and I'm wearing my Honey Badger shirt today. Uh, um, is the polar opposite the premium it's like, stuff? Like you've got the the highest quality ammunition that you could possibly buy. Like each round is physically inspected before it leaves there, and then you've got Tula uh, or Wolf or or whatever, yeah. Um, and <laughs> and it gobbled it up. It gobbled it up. We didn't have uh, first day. We didn't have any issues. We shot it with the the standard sights, uh, the standard sights that they that comes with it. And then uh, I took it and I removed the the rear sight housing. So basically, the the rear sight is adjustable for both uh, elevation and windage. 
the front sight doesn't move at all. So if you want to, if you need to adjust the elevation or the windage, you do it with the rear sight. And uh, I took that out and I replaced it with the, uh, the Crimson Trace, the mini red dot rail or plate housing, you know, mount. Uh, and I put that on there and uh, took it out and shot it. And here's what I discovered. I, ha I have a can, my training ammo can, and it literally has like remnants. It's filled with nine millimeter and, and, for years and years and years, I've tested and evaluated ammunition, and you know I had eight rounds of blank left in a box, so I dumped that into the can. Or I had six rounds of blank, you know, left in a box. I dumped that into the can. So it is, it is literally the variety pack. You know what I have in there, Jared? In addition, I have um, the old Corbon Power Shock. Uh, ammunition, you don't even know what that is, do you? The Corbon Power Shock. I've seen boxes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but that was before my time as a yeah, 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 person they, in the industry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> will, will you, will oh. you educate me how that came about? Oh, well, yeah, I've been, I've been writing for 100 years now. And, and uh, so, yeah, the Glazer, I have Corbon Glazer Safety Slugs. That's one. There's a blast from the past for you freaks out there. You're like, what? I haven't heard Corbon or Glazer safety slugs for ever. Do you know what a Glazer safety slug is, Jared? Um, no. Okay. I was it thinking, is a, thinking in my head of seeing a, a box a, of this. A hollow Only copper jacket. Is the Blazer. Nope. Like no, not Blazer. Rounds. Yeah. Not the Blazer ammo. It is a it, the Glazer safety slug was a uh, jacketed lead bullet hollow point, and the hole was filled with number I think it was number twelve shot, and then they put a plastic ball on top of it, <clears throat> and then this is when you say, "Do what now?" Yeah, what's that for? What's the purpose? Um, so that when it impacts, it opens up like a grenade. Okay. And it actually yeah. did that? Mm-hmm. Makes sense. And they're actually crazy that, expensive. Yeah, that probably did not, uh, probably wasn't great for the to, person being shot. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, but the problem, the uh, the downside uh, to that is that uh, if, you, if it strikes any kind of barrier, um you know, a, a door or any, any kind of material, uh, it would open up, it would disrupt, and then it, you just have, like, little pieces, parts continuing. Uh, now, lots of people were shot with that over the years, um, the Glazer safety slugs. I don't know how many lots are, but, uh, uh, yeah, Corbon was founded by Pete Pye Sr. in 1982. And uh, it was uh, sold in 2017. It was sold by, get this, Jared, here's, the company was sold to T.A. Perrine and moved to a little place called Worcester, Ohio. Ever heard of it? No. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> and then in 2021, the company was sold again to an investment group out of Sandusky, Ohio. Wow. So back to the geek canon here. How, tell me about how the, uh, the Crimson Trace mini red dot that you put on there. How, tell me how that worked out for you. Oh, it worked out great. Is actually, it, the height was correct and all that. Um, yeah, what, it, some yeah. some of the questions that I had from friends of mine were, "Well, is that thing is that red dot going to sit really high on the pistol?" And I was like, "No, I don't think so." Well, I, I mean, put one on there yet, so I wanted to get your take on that. Yeah, but uh, that's why they have adjustments. That's why it has an adjustment. Um, make sure you take that little tiny Allen wrench to the range with you. Uh, to make the adjustments. No, when when I put it on there, it was already zero for another gun, and I stripped it off a different gun, and I put it on that one. And at 10 yards, I just zeroed it on a, on a piece of steel. And uh, I had to – it was about six to eight inches high at 10 yards, so I just had to take the the, uh, the little Allen wrench and whoop, dial it down. It took about five or six rounds to get it zeroed at 10 yards, and I was good to go off and running. I shot the gun right-handed, left-handed, uh, here's the deal. It, it ran jacketed hollow point ammo about 50%. So 
That's so crazy to me that it feeds the like the lowest rung and the highest. Well, the honey right? badger. Yeah. Well, it makes sense because the honey badger is a different style of, of animal. Yeah. That, yeah, that's true. Uh, the bullet is designed to give you hollow point performance without having to expand. So the bullet doesn't, ha- matter of fact, it doesn't expand. It doesn't need to expand, but it still gives hollow point style. So uh, basically, eventually, I, I say eventually, what's going to happen is the old style hollow point bullets are going to start fading away because when you have right that Bill Wilson is a freaking genius. Bill, Bill Wilson bought that company. He bought the bullets Lehigh. He bought Lehigh ammunition because they patented Lehigh patented those bullets and uh, Jeff Hoffman. See Jeff Hoffman from black Hills is a very intelligent human too. When he discovered those bullets, he's like, I'm going to buy those from Lehigh, load them in my ammunition, uh, and call it the honey badger. Uh, You're going to see that, what's going to happen, because if you don't, the the biggest problem with hollow point ammo, and this has been the way, this has been the way it always has been for, geez, since I've been alive, is what happens if the hole in the hollow point gets plugged with drywall, with clothing material, with glass from shooting through glass or with wood, shoot through wood or whatever. What happens if the, if the, and drywall is a big, is a big hollow point killer because you shoot it through drywall and then the nose gets filled with drywall dust and then it hits the target and it doesn't open up. Right. Oh, and so it doesn't open and do its, I mean, it's still a bullet, you know, the, still doing bullet stuff, but it's not expanding like it was, like it was promised, like those super cool jello shots. You yeah. know, all the pictures of bullets you see in magazines, those are all jello shots, right? Those are the perfect, beautiful, a hundred, you know, if, if conditions were 100% perfect, that's what the bullet would look like. Uh, very rarely in a real world situation do the bullets come out of the target like that. But uh, any hooser. So, what's the story? The story with the Yeet Cannon is it's got it's a it's a sub. I think it's I'm trying to find. Oh, I know where it is. It's in a text. So now now that this is uh, <laughs> now that we are. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Jared, tell them how long we've been sitting on this gun. Uh, we've been sitting on it for a little while, and we've been chomping at the bit to tell you about it. Yeah. And- yeah, so we've been sitting on this gun. We've had it in our hands for a while, and we had to send an NDA. It, Charlie said the MSRP is 225 225 So the MSRP on this gun is $225. So what do you get for 225 bucks for two bills? You get a threaded barrel, you get 10 round magazine, you get uh, uh, the, uh, what do you call it, an option, yeah, an optic mount option. Um, yeah, it's, it's geez. And if it's 225 MSRP, what does that mean to the end user? That means that your local dealer is probably going to discount it to $199.99, right? That's a lot of gun for 200 bucks. It really is. So uh, I don't know. What do you think? Uh, I guess you think nothing. Okay. So oh, you're talking to me. I thought you were talking yeah. to the listener. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can get them. So right now you can get them in the the standard configuration. You can get the YC nine. Uh, you can get a YC nine with no without the word yeet cannon on there if if you don't want it you know like you can get a non-threaded barrel version if i don't know if you don't want that uh they're going to have the the crimson trace they're going to have one that comes with the the ct mini red uh dot mounted on it already so you can buy that um all together uh the one the one we have is actually the uh, this, the Yeet Cannon it has the Yeet Cannon inscribed on the side of it. It's got the threaded barrel and so forth. So uh, 
yeah, all of the all of the jacketed hollow point, we ran through it. I ran through Fioki and Remington and Federal and of course the Wolf stuff. And I even ran the uh the CCI aluminum blazer stuff through it, and then I ran yeah. the blazer brass through it. Uh and then of course the the honey badger stuff all ran a hundred percent. And I ran both the the subsonic and the supersonic through it. So and the subsonic ran fine with the can on it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, here's the deal. I'm going to tell you this. Uh, and this is high science, so it might be a little bit higher um, than the average the audience. To to. <laughs> yeah. Well, w- when, you, when you put a suppressor on a handgun or a rifle, for that matter, but if when you put a suppressor on there, you increase the back pressure from the gas uh, back into the chamber area, and uh, like I felt gas sting when I was shooting it with a suppressor. Now uh, that and Most I've had that with you do. yeah I've had that with with SIGs and Glocks and and Canics and and Berettas and everything. So that they, there is a, there's a big pressure there's a pressure change and you have to understand that. Um, so I, I don't know how many people who buy high points are also. <laughs> Let's face facts. You could buy three of the, two or three of these guns. No, three. You could buy three Yeet cannons for the price of one nine millimeter suppressor. <laughs> so, how, how many people who have Yeet cannons? It, it, here's the thing: people who already own a can a nine millimeter suppressor because they have other guns will buy this one just because. I don't see somebody who only has a yeet cannon and no other guns running out buying suppressors or silencers or cans. I, I would love that. That'd be awesome. I don't see that happening uh, because literally it's you like, could buy three pistols for the price of one silencer. The only gun that you own is a yeet cannon with a suppressor on it. That's I all I talk have. to you. Yeah. <laughs> I want to know how you think and what's going on in that head. Yeah. There you go. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. So and if uh, it's got a gold slide and money grips, even better. That's right. That's right. Oh, man. Yeah. So. There you go. There you go. So I was actually looking up suppressors. So uh, if you go to Silencer Central, that's right, Silencer Central, and uh, shop 9 mil. Where's the 9 mil? 9 mil, 9 mil. There we go. 9 millimeter. So you go to 9 millimeter cans. 9 millimeter cans. Wow. <laughs> the Banish, that's 45. Uh, the Dead Air Wolfman is eight ninety nine. Silencer Co. Omega eleven sixty nine. What do you get with that, man? Did you get a lifetime worth of HJs for? for that? It's like holy crap! Oh man, uh, I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> I'm in the wrong business, man. I mean, wow. So apparently, people are buying up nine millimeter cans. Because they're running out. The Dead Air Wolfman. Oh, Atlas. Atlas has one called the Pylum. Is it the Pylum or the, no, it's a Copus. No, Copus is a little one. Pylum is a big one. Right? Now that you said that, so I when can't, you say, it's now I'm confused. Uh, yeah, no, no. Yeah. No, I think the, I think the Copus is the little can for 22s. And I think the pylum is the uh, is the one for nine mil. Yeah, py- pylum mil. is the nine mil. Yeah, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I don't know if I've ever been exposed to the Copus, the twenty two can. It's the little can, the little one. It's the little guy, yeah. the little guy. So, but anyway, any hooser. Uh, that's that. So the Yeet Cannon is uh, is officially out. Congratulations to all of you guys. Who, if you were one of the people out there who voted for, yeah, the Copus KOPIS is a, not is a twenty two uh, rimfire can. Uh, if you were one of the people out there 
who voted way back when. <laughs> all, you remember all the way back then? Yeah, yeah. When uh, we were voting uh, to name it and that happened. You know, it's one of those be careful what you ask for. <laughs> you just might get it. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Be careful what you ask for, because you just might get it. And uh, and and kudos though to to those guys for for going with it, because you know, I, you know, they said, "Hey, what do you, what do you guys want?" And didn't they do like a top four? And they're like, "Okay, pick from the top four, and that that's what ended up getting the overwhelming yeah. majority. Yep. So it happened. It's real. Oh, Zachary. This is a good question. Um, what is the difference, Zachary, between Zachary, yes, Zachary. Canon and Canon? Uh, one throws large metal balls. The other one is the consistency in a story. There you go. Good job. So C-A-N-O-N stands for a, a, is a consistent canonical story. So when people say, Hey, you can't have that person doing that in the story because that's not canon. That's with one end or with actually two ends, not three ends. <laughs> two in a row, let's like squeeze together. But uh, but a C N N O N is the is the device that that throws projectiles downrange, and C A N O N is the is the standard. That's why the camera is C A N O N. Because it's a consi- it's consistent. consistent. I just that just clicked for me. Yes, yes. Because it's the mark of consistency, and that's what they were trying to say: is we're consistently good. So, well, you guys like that? You enjoyed it? All right. Well, good, awesome. Because uh, we're going to be back tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to be back for the bonus hour. Canada proves there is never enough gun control. Yes, they do. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. And uh, we're talking about critical thinking, and we're going to talk about leadership and fighting fitness. All of that tomorrow on Student of the Gun Radio on the bonus hour. If you'd like to join us, go to getsotg.com. That's getsotg.com and be there. We got a bonus hour Thursday, bonus hour Friday. You want to be there, you should be there, and uh, we suggest that you do. But until we're together again, remember, you're a beginner once. You're a student for life. Thanks for staying until the end. Want to water the seeds of freedom we planted together today? Head over to wherever you listen to us and leave a like, rating, or review. It makes a big difference. Have a show topic submission? We would love to hear it. Submit it to info at studentofthegun.com. A delightful human will get back to you faster than you can finish a one-box workout. Remember to check studentofthegun.com often for new and free content, giveaways, and more. Watch, listen, read, shop, and connect at studentofthegun.com. And remember, you are a beginner once, a student for life.